I encourage you to talk with Jim after the service, postpone morning plans just for a short time and hear more about his ministry. And being on the Global Missions team, I know we support him financially and through prayer, but that's something that every one of us can do, no matter where we are. So keep Jim and his family in your prayers. We're going to pray, uh, pray for them now. Lord, it's encouraging to hear reports of what you're doing around the world, and we are blessed and encouraged to have Jim with us this morning and just hear from him. Lord, you've given him skills already to reach many people from a variety of cultures, and I just pray that you continue to bless him with the ability to reach people, give him patience and knowledge as he continues to learn other cultures and how to effectively reach people. Lord, give him strength as he perseveres through a lot of challenges. He has ministries all over, not just with students, not just in other cultures, but also in his home. And I pray that you bless him and his family. Give them good relationships with you and good relationships with each other. Lord, help him to acclimate back to this time zone quickly, I pray. Give him strength and uh, just thank you for what you're doing in and through Jim. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to read with me from Romans 11. <clears throat> oh, that screen's not on. Okay, please join with me now. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Stand with me, please, as we sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Stay standing. We're going to transition. Praise the Lord Almighty. Praise to the Lord Almighty. All that hath life and breath come now with praises before him. Let the Amen sound from his people again. Gladly for I we adore him. You can be seated. Our scripture this morning is Joel 2, 28 through 32. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heaven and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said among the survivors whom the Lord calls. God, our Father, we adore Thee. We, Thy children, bless Thy name. 
chosen in the Christ before thee, we are holy without blame. We adore thee, we adore thee, Abba's praises we proclaim. We adore thee, we adore thee, Abba's praises we proclaim. Son eternal, we adore thee, Lamb upon the throne on high. Lamb of God, we bow before thee, thou hast brought thy people nigh. We adore thee, we adore thee, Son of God who came to die. We adore thee, we adore thee, Son of God who came to die. Holy Spirit, we adore thee, paraclete and heavenly guest, sent from God and from the Savior, thou hast led us into rest. We adore thee, we adore thee, by thy grace forever blessed. We adore thee, we adore thee, thy grace forever blessed. Let's pray together. Don't just listen, but pray along with me. O oh God, as the people of Jesus, we have come together to adore you, to worship you. But Lord, our lives are often chaotic and our minds are not strong enough to grasp the greatness and goodness of our God. So we're asking you now to give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Give us your spirit, O oh God, and reveal yourself to us that we might worship you and offer ourselves with wholehearted devotion to you. In the name of your Son, who is our Lord, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. If you're able, please stand with us for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> John 16, 12 through 15 says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you.
I've got a friend Closer than a brother There is no judgment Oh, how he loves me I've got a friend He is my strength He is my portion Be seated. Just going to mention a few things in our bulletin today. The elders are calling you to unite in prayer for God's guidance during our church's year of transition. So on Sunday the 26th, 10 a.m., that's this coming Sunday, we're going to have a prayer meeting in here. So not a Sunday school class, but a prayer meeting in here. And then we're going to come back at 6 o'clock and meet together in the auditorium so that we can unite as an entire church, praying for God's will, for his leadership as we move into the next phase of ministry here at Lockwood. Please be a part of this. Um, we are going to be baptizing some folks on April 2nd out at the Voss's Pool. 
and I'm excited about it to see who's being baptized, um, we want you to be a part of that too. So would you come and celebrate with folks? Baptism is a, an event for the entire church, not just for those who are being baptized. That's going to be April 2nd at the Voss's home. You can see the address in your bulletin. Uh, read about hospitality, volunteers, um, the loving mom memory. So if you have a memory, and it might not fit in this little tear-off, but if you have a memory, would you mark the tear-off? And you can write a little note, and if it's longer, you can send it to us in the, by email to the church office. We'd really appreciate that. The New Testament live seminar is happening at Gospel Center Missionary Church next week as well. And if you can go to that, there's a cost of $20 for adults, $5 for children. We'd encourage you to do that. We're thinking about doing that here at our church home. So we're sending a few people over to see what they think, come back and share it with us. But you'll get God's big picture at that seminar in fun and creative ways. You'll remember what you've learned. If you're interested in being part of that, would you mark the tear off and let us know? Now, there are other announcements in your bulletin. I'll just let you read those. Let's pray together now. Or well, actually, let's take the offering now. We'll pray together in just a minute. Guys, would you come and help us with the offering? As they're coming, would you grab that register that's on that side of your row and pass it this way? We'd really appreciate that. If this is your first time at Lockwood, let us know that too. We'll send you a little brochure in the mail about Lockwood and what God's doing here. Let's make this an act of worship and offer it and ourselves to the Lord. Lord, we offer you both these gifts and our lives, our obedience, so that you may be honored and glorified. With them, we worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen. When daylight breaks and morning do, you are, you are so good.
I want you to look at your bulletins. There are some prayer requests there. Would you see what you can do to help these folks? And would you pray for them? That's the primary thing you can do. And let's pray for them right now. Lord, we pray for our church family. Looking at various kinds of needs. We ask you to enter into their situation in ways that they'll recognize Grant them grace to trust you and to follow your leading. Give them perseverance through difficulty, joy in your love, and camaraderie with us, their brothers and sisters. I pray that you'll heal, that you will strengthen, and that you will bless them. Lord, we pray not only for these physical needs that we have, but also for our church family. May Jesus be exalted among us. May his worth, his value be revealed to us in ways that raise our devotion. Not just us, but your church, wherever it's meeting today and around our community. Would you speak to us through your word now? In Jesus' name, amen. We're in a series on the church. Today we're looking at Acts chapter 2, which recounts the origins of the church. When God poured out his spirit on the 120 Jesus followers who had gathered in Jerusalem, they went from being friends and associates with a shared history to being the church of Jesus Christ with a shared eternal future. The same spirit that had been in Peter was now in Mary Magdalene. The spirit in John was in Cleopas. The spirit in Matthew was in Mary, the mother of Jesus. These people had known each other for a long time, but they were suddenly together in a way they had not been before. They were united. The Spirit of God was coordinating them. They had become the church. This was an epic-making moment in the history of the world. It marked the threshold of Earth's last era and triggered the transformation, you could say evolution if you preferred, of humanity into a new kind of existence to material beings of the animal kingdom, the homo sapien sapiens, was added the divine spirit. This would prepare humans for the resurrection and for life in the age to come. This would also connect humans to each other in the life of this age. As I was exegeting this passage and preparing to preach it, I outlined it 
in five points. So we have what happened. That's the event. That's in verses 1 through 4. What was going on, the setting, those are verses 8 through 13. What it meant, the sermon, those are verses 14 through 35. What to do about it, the application, those are verses 36 through 41. And what resulted, the church, those are verses 42 through 47. Now, it could take hours to unpack that. We don't have hours, so let's get right to it. We'll look at what happened. It was the day of Pentecost, a word we're familiar with, which was the celebration of the Feast of Weeks. It was called Pentecost because it took place 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. Pentecost means 50 in Greek. Jesus' apostles, <clears throat> along with more than 100 of his followers, had been meeting together much of the last 50 days, ever since the resurrection. On the day of the feast, they were together again, perhaps in the same upper room where they had gathered on the night before Jesus was betrayed. The house where they stayed must have been near the temple because only houses in the temple precinct were large enough to accommodate so many people. The giving of the Spirit was accompanied by three extraordinary phenomena. There was the unaccountable sound of a violent wind. We don't read anything about the feel of the wind, only the sound of it. There was the astonishing sight of something that looked like flames of fire appearing above the head of each person present. And there was the amazing testimony of the people who began speaking in languages that they didn't know, enabled by the spirit that was within them. <clears throat> This is what happened. <clears throat> in verses 5 through 13, Luke pans out a little, and he gives us the setting in which this took place. When people came to find out what was making the strange wind-like sound, they heard another strange sound. Jesus' people were talking about God in 15 different languages. They asked, aren't these people all Galileans? Galilee, they thought about Galileans the way we think of Marvin, who's from South Carolina. He talks with an accent. Galileans for no, were known for their distinctive way of speaking. We would say they have an accent. A linguist would say that they drop laryngeals and aspirates. But the foreigner said, they're speaking my language. Notice what they spoke. This is verse 11. <clears throat> the wonders, or literally in Greek, the great things of God. Very often in Scripture, and nearly always in Luke's writings, the Holy Spirit is associated with the way people speak. Some Bible students say the evidence that a person is filled with the Spirit is speaking in tongues, but the Bible goes beyond that. The evidence is speaking in love. Someone who speaks in truth, Someone who speaks in tongues on Sunday and speaks with contempt on Monday is not someone who's filled with the Spirit. Most of the people who heard this, the disciples speaking were amazed. In fact, Luke uses three different words for, to indicate wonder and amazement in this passage. But some of them just mocked and said, those people had one too many last night. I suspect that those people were like the apostles, Galileans, who didn't hear their own dropped laryngeals and aspirates. It's the people who think they know you who often miss what you have to say. Now, notice that the Spirit's presence in the disciples led people to ask questions. Jesus' people were different. They still are. People ought to be asking questions about us, about our generosity, our fearlessness, our love for each other, our honesty, our kindness, our hopefulness. There's something else to understand about what's happening here that we'll miss if we're not familiar with the Old Testament. After God created human beings, he appointed them to rule the world as his regents. But humans, so this is Genesis chapter 3, turned away from God. Theologians refer to it as the fall. And everything began falling apart. You see that in Genesis 4 through chapter 11. When we arrive at chapter 11, we see how bad things have become. 
the people of the city of Babel are constructing a ziggurat, a temple of sorts, to reach heaven. They're trying to force their way into God's place, into authority and power without God. At Babel, God brought that attempt to an end by scattering the people and confusing their languages. No longer would people be able to understand each other, which is a loss that has impoverished humanity ever since. But at Pentecost, God began to reverse this, the scattering of people. People from 15 different language groups understood each other. Many came to share the same spirit. What was lost in the world was being reintroduced in the church, which from the beginning has been a multinational, multilingual, ethnically diverse people who are yet united. The scattering of humanity is being undone within the church of Jesus Christ. I'd encourage you to talk to Jim about that. Go to other places in the world and find the church of Jesus, and you'll find that they're your people. So the disciples heard the surprising sound of a strong rushing wind in the house where they were meeting. The sound was so loud that people outside the house came to see what was happening. The Christians saw what looked like a flame of fire resting above each other's heads. And when they spoke, it was in languages that they had never learned. This took place on Pentecost Sunday, 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. Visitors who were in town for the feast heard the disciples declaring the praises of God in their own languages. That's what happened. But what did it mean? The Apostle Peter answers that question. He begins by saying first what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean we're drunk. And he adds with, with his sense of humor, it's only nine in the morning, guys. We're not drunk. What it does mean is that the last days are upon us. That's verse 17. God is keeping his word through the prophet Joel and is pouring out his spirit on all people, not just on kings and prophets and judges. This, as Peter says down in verse 33, is what you now see and hear. The last days have begun. Why then? Why at this point in history? Why didn't it happen in the prophet Joel's time? Or for that matter, in our time? Why now? Peter's answer is, because of Jesus. Everything changed with the coming of Jesus. He is the hinge on which the door of history swings. Peter says that Jesus was a man accredited to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him. So in the ancient world, when someone came to a new community, say Jim Merrick is going to a community in Albania, he would bring with him letters of introduction from shared acquaintances or from well-known people. Jesus brought his letter of introduction, which came from God himself and was written in the ink of miracles and wonders and signs. And Peter asked them, how did you accept him when he came this way? Here's what you did. With the help of wicked men, and in Greek that's literally lawless men, he's talking about Gentiles. With the help of lawless men, you put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God, Peter said, knew what would happen and incorporated your rejection into his plan. Then he raised Jesus from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Peter uses a remarkable metaphor here. The word for agony is the common word for birth pangs. The agony of death turned out to be the birth pangs of the new humanity. As proof that God raised Jesus from the dead. Peter quotes Psalm 16. It was written by Jesus' great ancestor, King David, about a thousand years earlier. In the poem, we have the line, my body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me the King James says to the grave, the NIV says to the realm of the dead. In, in 
Psalm 16, in Hebrew, it is to Sheol. In Greek, it's to Hades. Nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Peter goes on to argue that King David died a long time ago. In fact, everyone knows where his grave is. And his body did decay. David could not have been referring to himself in Psalm 16. No, he was speaking prophetically, Peter says, of the Messiah who was to come. A prophecy God just fulfilled a little over a month ago by raising Jesus from the dead. And it was this Jesus raised from the dead and exalted to the place of honor at God's right hand. This Jesus who is both Lord of all and Messiah of the Jews, verse 36, who is responsible for the events on the day of Pentecost. He sent the Holy Spirit on the church and launched the final epoch of Earth's history. Jesus is the key to everything. Now, so far, we've seen what happened, the event, what was going on at the time, the setting, what it meant, Peter's sermon. In verses 37 through 40, we see what to do about it, the application. When people realized what Peter was saying and understood by God's grace, understood that he was speaking truth, they were aghast. They had killed the Messiah God had sent to rescue them. They got rid of the only person who could help them. Luke says they were pierced to the heart, or cut to the heart when they heard this and asked Peter and the apostles what they should do. Was it too late for them? Were they destined to ruin because they'd not recognized the Messiah? Peter holds out hope to them. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now that makes us pause, right? I thought all you needed to do was believe, but Peter says, repent and be baptized. Well, first of all, it's clear to me that Peter's hearers did believe. Otherwise, they would not have asked them what they should do. Repentance and baptism are not a substitute for nor an add-on to belief. They are the outworking of belief. In repentance, a person rethinks his life and makes changes so that he can align himself with the truth, with reality. Repentance is that moment when I realize that the road I'm on is not going the direction I need to go. And unless I'm a fool, I'm going to get off that road and find another. There's nothing meritorious about repentance. It's not some admirable achievement on my part. In fact, it, it is a gift of God. But what about baptism? Now, think back to what Peter said earlier. He was quoting the prophet Joel in verse 21 and said that if people call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. Here he's telling them how to call by being baptized in Jesus' name. So, so Ananias used very similar language when he said to Saul, who would later be Paul, and now what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When Peter said this, some of his hearers would have been upset. In Judaism, baptism was normally reserved for pagan Gentiles who were converting, who wanted to become Jews. The idea that pious Jews needed to be baptized was offensive. What would people think if I got baptized? But Peter doesn't offer any alternatives. He requires, as Craig Keener put it, a public, radical testimony of conversion, not a private, non-committal request for salvation. Now, it's not that a person cannot be baptized privately. The Ethiopian in Acts 8 was but never as a way of avoiding the public, radical testimony that I belong to Jesus Christ. The baptism is in the name of Jesus Christ. That's verse 38. Because of that verse, 
Some churches don't baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as Jesus instructed us in Matthew 28, only in the name of Jesus. I think that's an error. When Peter tells them to be baptized in the name of Jesus, he's indicating what kind of baptism it is and differentiating it from other ancient ceremonial washings. He's not giving a ritual formula to be spoken over people being baptized. If that were the case, he would have used the active, not the passive voice. Now, we've seen what happened on the day the church was born what was going on at the time, what it meant, what to do about it. In verses 42 through 47, we see what resulted from it. United by God's spirit, people were hungry to know about God. And so they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's verse 42. That happens when people are filled with God's spirit. They want to know God. They want to know more. They were also hungry to be together. In verses 42 through 47, the NIV uses the word together three times, trying to bring out what they see in the Greek text. The disciples were devoted to the fellowship and to the shared meal times. They were looking out for each other's needs. I know some people insist that the mark of being filled with the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. And that certainly happened in verse 4, and it's wonderful. But the more definitive indicator is what happens in verse 42 through 47. A longing to know God and a love and affection for his people. Now, let's put all of this in context, and then we'll look at how it applies to us. Acts 2 describes the day the church was born. This is an historic, never-to-be-repeated event, like the death and resurrection of Christ. We don't read again of the sound of a violent wind or of the sight of flames of fire, and only once more in Acts do we read of people speaking in tongues, and that was the day when Gentiles were brought into the church. This day was unique. That does not mean that being filled with the Holy Spirit is unique. That happens repeatedly in the book of Acts though without the accompanying signs. It can also happen in our lives. And when it does, things will be different. For example, and we see this in our text, under the influence of the Spirit, a person will alter the way he or she speaks. There is a strong link in Scripture, and especially in the two books Luke wrote, between the presence of God's Spirit and the way a person talks. Speaking in other tongues is the most obvious example in verse 4. But people filled with the Spirit also praise God, verse 11. And you can find the same thing in Luke's Gospel, for example, in chapter 1, verses 67 and on, chapter 10, verse 21. And they prophesy, that's verse 16. And they witness, that's chapter 4, verse 8 and on, and in Luke chapter 12, and other places as well. What they don't do is gossip or grumble. Paul tells the Ephesians not to let unwholesome, literally rotten talk come out of their mouths. And in the very next verse, he warns them not to grieve the Holy Spirit. I think those two things are linked. A few verses later, he unpacks what he means by rotten speech, shameful and foolish talk, obscenities, coarse joking. People who are filled with the Spirit don't talk like that, but they do speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. They do sing and make music in their hearts to God. They give God thanks for everything. That, by the way, follows immediately on the verse that says, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So there's been disagreement in the church about whether speaking in tongues is the required proof of the presence of the Spirit. For various biblical reasons, I've come to the conclusion it's not. But speech is clearly important. Just don't limit it to other tongues. How you speak in your native tongue is even more significant an indicator of the Spirit's presence in your life. Certainly more space is devoted to it in the Scriptures. 
Now there's something else here. The Lord poured out the Spirit on people who were all together. We read that in verse 1 of this chapter. We see it many times at the end of the chapter. We see it in chapter 1. Divisions, animosity, and strife get in the way of what God wants to do in a church's or an individual's life. We must forgive each other and be reconciled to each other, or we will not experience the life God intends for us and the fullness of his spirit in us. If there's something between you and another Christ follower, get it worked out and be reconciled. God will honor you for it, whatever the other person does. And ask God for the Holy Spirit, for yourself and for our church. How much more, Jesus asked, will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Don't ask so you can have an experience but so that you can be the person that God always intended you to be. And do that not just for yourself, but for the church. Now let's pray together. Father, we ask you to give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. And like the Apostle Paul, we will not stop asking. Oh God, give us your spirit. Unite us. Through us, declare the praises, the great things of God. I ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll sing.
few things now. I want to invite anyone who would like to come and pray for our church. Each week I've been inviting people lately to come up and pray for our church. You can just sit in the first three rows and pray. A prayer helper will come and ask you if you'd like them to pray with you. If you would, say sure. If not, you can just pray by, silently by yourself. The prayer helpers are also here for any needs you might have in your life. Come and talk with them and say, pray for me, share your need with them. They'll keep it between you and them and God. Uh, there are Go Deep sheets out on the, the cafe tables or in the back of our room. So pick up one of those. It'll help you through Acts chapter 2. There's a lot we weren't able to talk about this morning. I encourage you to do that. You can come on uh, Wednesday night at 630 to go deep right out here in the room behind the, the auditorium. Also, if you can stay, I encourage you to stay and hear what Jim has to share, what God's been doing in his ministry and what he's been seeing in the God's church around the world. That's going to happen at 10 o'clock. Now, let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, you know that we are not enough without you. We are like grass that appears for a day and is burned up and we don't have much staying power. But we know that we are not without you. Oh, that you would pour out your spirit again upon your people and your people in this place. We ask you to do this not so that we can have an experience, but so that you can have the glory and so that Jesus Christ can be honored among us. And we pray these things in his name. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of his spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.